one. We'll get started in about one minute. All right, you got a one minute warning. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doctor. You bet. How is everyone this morning? Dr. Thibodeau? Good? Good. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Nirav Shah, and I am the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to start this morning's briefing by acknowledging a couple of the changes that we have made to the layout. The first is I'd like to thank our colleagues here at the Maine Emergency Management Agency for letting us use their space. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the members of the media for accommodating this change. We have changed up the location a bit to ensure that we have as much physical distance as possible within these briefings to try to keep, as, uh, try to keep everyone safe as we can. I'd also like to thank Maine Public for the physical or the technical backdrop uh, to allow us to uh, have a pool camera here. In terms of where the state of Maine stands with respect to coronavirus. As of right now, the Maine CDC is reporting 107 cases of coronavirus across the state. This reflects an increase in 18 cases since yesterday. At present, we have reports of 12 individuals who are hospitalized and additional research and investigation is being done to determine other epidemiological features about these uh, take cases in total. Overall, the Maine CDC has received over 3,000 requests for consultation since our activation began. And the total number of negative tests that have been performed is 2,791 across the state. I'd like to put some of these numbers in perspective for everybody. Yesterday in Maine, there were 89 cases. Note that that number, 89, is the total number of cases that existed in the entire United States on March 1st. Right now, there are over 35,000 cases in the United States. I offer that contextual piece just to provide a sense of how quickly diseases like COVID-19 caused by this coronavirus can spread. Now, I am not saying that 23 days from now there will be 35,000 cases in Maine. That is not the reason I offer that. I do offer it, however, to illustrate how a virus that spreads to two or three people from every one person who gets it can go from 80 or 90 cases a few weeks ago to over 35,000 cases across the country. And it really illustrates why some of the other things that we'll talk about today around physical distancing are really essential. I'd like to next talk about our ongoing distributions of protective equipment. Again, protective equipment or what is now known as PPE are pieces of equipment that our healthcare workers and vital first responders wear in order to ensure that they stay, stay safe as they are doing the essential work of keeping everyone else in Maine safe and healthy. There has been in Maine and elsewhere concerns about the availability of protective equipment as there have been across the country. Our team at the Maine CDC has been working to distribute this precious resource fairly and equitably across the healthcare provider landscape in the state. We are continuing that distribution process today. So just today, we will be continuing the work of distributing PPE and sending out, with partnership from the Department of Transportation, almost 22,000 pieces of protective equipment to healthcare providers and facilities across the state. This includes, among other things, approximately 2,500 N95 masks, over 8,000 procedure masks or surgical masks, nearly two, th I'm sorry, nearly 1,800 face shields, and 
almost 6,000 pairs or 6,000 gloves to healthcare workers across the state. All told, we will be distributing again nearly 22,000 pieces of protective equipment to healthcare workers, frontline responders, and EMS personnel across the state, as we have been doing for several weeks now. That's the distribution side. We are also working to increase our supplies. As we've discussed in these meetings, the amount of PPE that we need does not match yet what we have been receiving. For that reason, Governor Mills last week sent a letter to Vice President Pence and Secretary Alex Azar urging the federal government to increase the distribution of protective equipment to states like Maine. Today, we expect to receive the following distributions of protective equipment from the strategic national stockpile managed by the U.S. government. What we expect to receive today are approximately 12,800 N95 masks, over 30,000 procedure masks, approximately 5,800 face shields, approximately 4,700 surgical gowns, and about 16,800 gloves. We continue to urge the federal government to increase the pace of distributions from the strategic national stockpile so that we, working with our colleagues at MEMA and the Department of Transportation, can distribute those life-saving pieces of equipment to healthcare workers and EMS personnel and all other frontline responders to keep everybody safe. I'd like to now provide an update for everybody on testing. In recent days, the main CDC's laboratory, as well as laboratories across the country, have followed the recommendations from the US CDC to focus our testing on the highest risk groups in the state of Maine. This involves, for example, individuals who are hospitalized. Now we do this for two reasons. The first is that individuals who are hospitalized have physicians and healthcare providers who need to know the results of those tests as quickly as possible so they can make clinical decisions as well as decisions about when to discontinue protective equipment. We also know that individuals who are hospitalized who might have COVID-19 are at a higher risk. As a result of this focus on highest risk groups, we recognize that folks across Maine are waiting for results. I acknowledge that. I recognize that that wait time causes anxiety and it causes frustration, especially at a time right now when no one needs any more anxiety and frustration in their lives than they already have. This is evidence of the ways in which COVID-19 is affecting more and more people on a personal level. Even if you yourself might not be waiting for test results, it's likely that you know someone who is. I ask that you bear with us just a bit. We are in the same boat as the rest of the country right now, but we've got a plan. And right now our focus is on two areas to try to speed up the testing. First is that our laboratory team in Augusta is investigating the purchase of an additional piece of equipment. Right now, one of the major bottlenecks with testing across the country is the availability of what is called a reagent. This is a chemical that's used in the conduct or the performance of the test itself. There is a nationwide shortage of this reagent, this chemical, not just in Maine, but across the country. Now we have been urging the manufacturer to ramp up the production of that chemical. But right now it's a little bit like if everybody in the United States today decided to go out and buy a thousand skateboards. The system right now isn't set up for that, although it's getting there. 
In order to get around this, one of the strategies that our laboratory team is, is looking into is purchasing a different type of equipment that uses a different type of chemical for which right now there's not a shortage. The other thing that is happening on the testing framework or testing landscape is that commercial laboratories across the country are increasing their availability and their capacity to do testing. These are groups like Quest and LabCorp, as well as some others that are working on this. We are working with those groups to make sure that when they conduct tests on Maine people, we get those results as quickly as possible so that we can do our investigation. We're also working with those groups to keep tabs on their capacity overall to try to relieve this and speed up the testing. But I fully acknowledge that this delay in having folks get their test results is concerning, it's anxiety inducing, and it's frustrating. I ask that you bear with us. We are aware of this concern and we're working on solving it and at least making inroads as quickly as possible. I pledge that we are working on this and that when we have updates, I will share them with everybody. More generally, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about the ways and acknowledging the ways that COVID-19 has been affecting all of our lives. The first is in connection with the discussions we've had about steps that everyone can take to introduce that physical distance, to flatten that curve that we've heard so much about. And we've also gotten questions about ways in which individuals in different parts of the state should be changing their behavior and whether they should wait until there are cases in their county. And here's what I'd like to ask everyone to do. I'd like to ask everyone to live your life as if COVID-19 is already in your community. When it comes to outbreaks, we are often in any outbreak situation just detecting the tip of the iceberg at any one time. And as time goes on, we learn more and more and more about the depth and the scope of that iceberg. So what we know right now is that even if COVID-19 has not been confirmed in your county, it's likely there. And I ask you to live your life in such a fashion as if it were already there, to introduce that physical distancing. On a more personal note, I also ask everyone to live their life as if you yourself were to have the disease. Now, what do I mean by that? The way that I go about my life is to assume that I might have the virus. That helps me get myself in the frame of mind to make sure that I'm keeping the right physical distance from folks, that I'm coughing into my shoulder, that if I'm not feeling well, I'm not going into a meeting. The folks here in the room might have noticed that before even coming into this space, we're asking everybody to get a temperature check. That's just part of this frame shift that we all are going to have to get used to. And the way that I orient my own thinking is to go about my day as if I were to have the virus. And that allows me to make sure I'm taking the steps to keep everyone else around me safe. When we talked a week or two ago about flattening the curve, it was something of an abstract discussion. But today, it's real. How you live your life today could affect the lives of others in your community tomorrow. And for that reason, I really do ask everyone to keep an eye out around them and try to introduce as much distance as possible. I wanna end also acknowledging the stress and uncertainty of these times. This is a, for many of us, maybe for all of us, uncharted territory. And we're at a time when even though science is learning more and more about coronavirus at a pace that really has never been seen before, there are still more questions than answers. And in times like that, in times of uncertainty and in times of stress, fear, 
anxiety and frustration are completely normal responses. I ask each of you to recognize that you are not alone, not in your community, not in your state, not in your country. We are all in that same boat where there are more questions than answers right now. If you have questions, if you've got concerns, if you've got fear, if you have anxiety and frustration, call somebody. You can call 211 in Maine and they can connect you with folks who can help you with that. If you feel that you are in crisis right now, please call the Maine Crisis Hotline. The number is 888-568-1112 if you feel that you are in crisis. Please recognize that you are not alone right now. You have a community and people can be there for you even if they are not there with you. So with that, I'd like to take any questions you may have. Yes. With the numbers continuing to rise, is there any evidence of community transmission in any other counties? Um, our epidemiology team is investigating that possibility. As of right now, community transmission has only been confirmed in Cumberland County, but we strongly believe that it will soon be confirmed in other counties. My ask to everybody, and the question is with respect to community transmission. My apologies for those watching. My ask to everybody is to go about your life and live your life as if community transmission were there. Even though we have not confirmed it as an epidemiological matter for counties outside of Cumberland, we believe that we will in keeping with the pattern that's been observed in other parts of the Northeast and other parts of the country. Yes. We're seeing a lot of families uh, coming up from Massachusetts and New York to their vacation homes or cottages and such. Is that a concern for you? And do you recommend, is there anything you do to stop it? Uh, the question is, is what can we say and how should we think about individuals who are coming to Maine? And I continue to believe that Maine is the most welcoming place I've ever lived in my life. And I hope it stays that way. So, Steve. Yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. Steve, I'll go to Steve and then uh, to, go ahead, Steve. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I guess... As you're aware, some other states have um, mandatory stay-at-home orders. Massachusetts just issued one this morning. Mm -hmm. With the increase that we're seeing, at what point, what's the threshold at which time you would recommend that for me, if ever? So, so Steve's question is, uh, how should we think about some orders that have been enacted in other states recommending, requiring that folks stay at home? Uh, in other states, uh, in some states, they've been referred to as shelter-in-place orders. Uh, it's something that we've discussed. We continue to discuss it. We discuss every potential option on the table. Here are some questions that I have. Um, as we evaluate this, I'll just kind of provide a, a glimpse into how I'm thinking about this. The first question that comes to my mind is how should we evaluate the efficacy, the effectiveness of any such order? And we have to do so against the backdrop of the orders and recommendations that Governor Mills has already put into place. We don't come to this discussion having done nothing. We come to the discussion having done a substantial amount, in many cases, more than what other states have done. Uh, to recap, uh, Governor Mills on March 18th closed all restaurants and bars to dine-in customers. She also limited any, or she also recommend, I'm sorry, she also limited non-essential discretionary gatherings of more than 10 or more individuals. She also were urged non-essential public facing businesses to close. So we come to this discussion about stay at home orders from in some cases a different place from other states. So I think we have to recognize what's already been put into place. Uh, the other thing that I think we have to recognize is just the epidemiological profiles. Maine is not Manhattan. Uh, there are 1.6 million people in Manhattan alone, an island of 23 square miles. There are 1.3 million people in the entirety of Maine, a state of 35,000 square miles. Uh, the average population density in Manhattan is about 70,000 people per square mile. In Maine, it's 43. <laughs> So there are different epidemiological profiles 
that we have to take into account as we're evaluating this. The other question that my team and I, our team, are thinking about are other factors. Life has to go on, and in particular, the medical system has to continue. For example, right now, there's a shortage of blood in Maine. And how should we think about alleviating that shortage in the setting of a stay-in-place order? So we're thinking about these things. We're thinking about them very intensely. And these are, this is a glimpse of some of the considerations that we're keeping in mind as we evaluate this issue. So uh, there's a follow-up question over here, and then we'll come back over there. Yeah. question about blood drives. Yep. Uh, the only way to alleviate that shortage is to have blood collections and donations. What's your advice about that? Based on where we are right now, this is as of, you know, 1150. Uh, blood shortage is significant. Healthcare workers, physicians, physicians assistants who are caring for critically ill pa people need to have all of the supports available. In some cases, it's protective equipment. In other cases, it's a supply of blood. So blood donation is still possible. Blood centers in Maine our blood donation centers are equipped to still take blood. They are aware of the social distancing, physical distancing requirements. And so at this time, blood donation continues to be, in my view, the civic obligation that it was even before. We are continuing to evaluate this situation because of how rapidly moving the coronavirus situation is. That may change, and I'll be candid about that. But at this time, we have to make sure that for individuals who need blood, they're able to get it. The, this, the, the situation is in flux. It's changing hour by hour. But that just gives you a glimpse of kind of, of how we're thinking about this. I'm going to go to this side of the room and then over to Kevin. Yes. What's the latest on the discussion on industrial sites? Last week you were discussing that and potential changes for that in construction sites, particularly places like Bat Meyer Works. Uh, so the question is, is how should we think about and evaluate industrial locations? Um, again, that discussion in, in general around workplace safety is something that's going on. It's still pretty much a part of how we think about our daily analysis of where we are. Uh, it's, so we're continuing to take a look at the data, uh, take a look at different types of work sites to see whether some are different from others. Again, we're really looking at physical distancing. Um, and then with respect to Bath Iron Works in particular, uh, you know, what I can say is that there are broader discussions there involving many different stakeholders, given the various security implications. Uh, we're part of those discussions, but they, they are happening at many different levels, including at the federal government. So uh, I'm going to go, sorry, going to go over to Kevin and then back over here. Kevin. Great. Uh, so Kevin's question is uh, numbers around self-quarantine, self-isolation. Uh, we'll get you the latest updated numbers, but I want to just review the recommendations that we have in place for when folks call us or when they might interact with their physician. If you're not feeling well and you have signs and symptoms of what might be coronavirus, cough, a fever, shortness of breath, we strongly recommend in the strongest possible terms, that you stay home. You stay home and try to keep yourself isolated for at least 14 days and until those symptoms resolve. That's the advice that we have given to healthcare providers as well as other groups across Maine. And so, Kevin, to your question, they don't report back into us how many times they have dispensed that advice and to which individuals. So the number that we have is just the, just the number of individuals to whom we have directly given that advice. But if, say, for example, a hospital system has a number of employees who are not feeling well, they would have dispatched that same advice to them, but not necessarily have reported those numbers to Maine CDC. We'll get you the latest number that we have, but please recognize that others are out there operationalizing that same advice on staying home if they're not feeling well or staying home if they've been exposed to somebody who might have the disease. So the number that we have by design is not the complete picture, but we will certainly get you what we've got. Uh, I'm going to go, where am I at? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go over here to Phil, and then we'll go back over here. Phil. Thank you, Doctor. Two questions. Just following up what I think I heard you just say, was the, 
two questions. What about testing with Afghan? On testing, it sounds like you just said if you deal sick, self-isolate for 14 days, don't seek a test. It seems there's been a shift here and, and in other states against the idea that, gosh, we just tested a lot more people, we would flatten the curve and, and start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. That seems to have changed, if you could speak to that. And the second one on travel, someone asked about out-of-staters coming to Maine. Again, your advice for people who are in Maine who might have camps or uh -huh. houses in the woods, who might be traveling from those southern eight counties that have uh, positive cases to the eight counties where you haven't told us there are cases, remote areas, going to gas stations, going to stores, and uh -huh. just going there. Uh, good idea or bad idea? So let's talk about testing. So Phil's first question is, has there been a shift in who we recommend should be tested? Uh, if someone is well and they have signs and symptoms of coronavirus, so a mild cough, mild fever, no shortness of breath, it's really up to the clinician as to whether they should be tested for COVID-19. Maine CDC doesn't stand in that way. What we However, and there are now more and more commercial tests available operated by companies like Quest, LabCorp, and others that are able to do that test. However, at the same time, we recognize that there are certain groups of individuals who we're focusing on because the result of that test may have implications for their immediate clinical management or for the public health system overall. So those are folks like folks who are in the hospital. There's an immediate clinical decision that might be made. Do you give this drug for something or do you withhold it if they do or do not have coronavirus? Or for example, for first responders and other healthcare workers. If they test positive, there are implications for the healthcare workforce. So we have focused on certain groups. That being said, the fundamental decision of whether someone should be tested is still up to a physician. And now, as more and more tests are coming online by other entities, being able to do on the order of tens of thousands per day, we believe that testing numbers will come up. But that being said, and I want to acknowledge there are certain groups that we do remain focused on because of the immediate public health or clinical implications of that. As a result, there might be some delays. I acknowledge that as well, and I recognize how frustrating that can be. Now, Phil's other question is, what can we say about individuals who are just within the state of Maine traveling to other parts of the state? Um, you know, this is, this is something that comes up in virtually every single infectious disease. Um, what we probably know right now is that, as we've talked about, when you're dealing with an infectious disease, one of the numbers that are really critical is what we call the incubation period. That's the period between when someone is exposed and when they start developing symptoms. And as a result of that, with coronavirus, it can be anywhere from two up to 16 days. As a result of that, what we know is that we are always watching a live broadcast of something that was actually filmed anywhere from two to 16 days ago. And so for that reason, right now, what we are seeing as the development of the virus, as it spreads in number and geography, is travel that probably actually occurred and exposures that actually occurred one to two weeks ago. So as a result of that, folks will continue to travel, but we reinforce our recommendation that if they are traveling up to their camp and they don't feel well, regardless of where they are and regardless of where they came from, they stay inside and try to limit their exposure to others. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go, gonna go back over to Brad and then we'll come back over. Yep, Brad. Uh, what, what can you say about the ocean view and the of cases? I think they said they were up to six, is that the latest number? Do you know how many other people are at risk at this point? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, have you in fact figured out the, the source of the infection? So um, the question from Brad is about ocean view. And we, um, and where are we? I wanna emphasize that in general, and in particular with vulnerable populations, our top priority is working with communities like Ocean View to make sure they can keep all of their residents safe. Uh, based on the latest information that we have from our epidemiology team, we believe there are six individuals uh, affiliated with the Ocean View community who live at the Ocean View com community who have been tested positive. We continue to work with them. Uh, we are very concerned and continue to be and want to work and are continuing to work with Ocean View. I've actually asked uh, my senior deputy within the Maine CDC to, to have a standing call 
with the director of operations at Ocean View every single day to make sure we're getting them what they need. Yesterday, we spoke to them and they had an immediate request for some protective equipment. It happened to be on pretty much on my way home. So I hand delivered that request to them yesterday night just to make sure that they have everything they need. We stand by them and are continuing to work with them. We know that they too want to keep everyone in their community safe. And we're, we're working with them day in and day out, day in and day out. Um, gentlemen here, I'm sorry, I yeah, forgot to call on you. Go ahead. Good. Uh, so the question is ICU beds and what can we say about the individuals thus far who are hospitalized? Um, as of this morning, there are 71 ICU beds that are available across the state of Maine. We have asked healthcare systems across the state to report into us on a twice daily basis the availability of a number of different resources, including ICU beds as well as other resources. Now, in terms of the other individuals, the 12 individuals who are hospitalized, for privacy reasons, we are we're not disclosing what percentage are uh, in in pay, uh, sorry in ICUs, et cetera. Um, we continue to work with their healthcare providers to provide those providers the latest information from the U.S. CDC, but we're not providing any further information in terms of where they are. But we do continue to work with them and, and always wish all of those individuals the best of all luck. Um, I think we're yeah, back over there. We've, we've heard uh, some of this individually, I'm sure. A lot of people who are main residents go south in the winter, so follow up to that question, are coming home early. Should people coming back to Maine from other states start making that travel? Should they self quarantine or do it? Uh, so um, the, the question is uh, should individuals who are returning to Maine from other parts of the country, perhaps other parts of the globe, self quarantine for two weeks um, or some period of time? So here is the latest guidance from the US CDC. As of right now, if individuals are returning from other countries, that are known to have high levels of COVID-19 transmission. These are countries like Italy, as an example. They are asked to self-quarantine when they return back to Maine for that period of two weeks. If they develop symptoms during that time period, they're asked to reach out to their healthcare provider to determine next steps, if any. Now, what can we say about individuals who are, who are returning from other parts of the country, where there may also be high rates of transmission of COVID-19. At this time right now, there is no official recommendation for the, from the US CDC. But for those folks, I would urge them to do what I think everyone should be doing, which is that if you've returned from a part of the country where there are known high numbers of cases and you're not feeling well, please make sure you stay inside. At baseline, everyone in Maine should be looking to introduce that physical distancing, regardless of whether you're at home or elsewhere. And so I would urge everyone who's coming back from another part of the country to adhere to the same guidelines, to try to stay inside if they're not feeling well, and always, where possible, introduce as much physical distance from one another as you can. So, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Yep, so Kevin's question is, is how we count and work with individuals who may be permanent out-of-state residents, but who may be in Maine for, for the time being. And, and Kevin, I think your question gets at um, a good point here, which is how should we think about individuals who are in our communities who may or may not have COVID-19? And I recognize that there are requests from folks to know exactly how many people in their town or in their community might have COVID-19. The, the supposition underneath those requests is that if they knew that there was somebody in their town 
who had COVID-19, they would do something different. And my request is to not wait until that data are out there. Right now, I recommend, I ask that everyone go about their lives as if COVID-19 were already in your community. Maybe it already is, maybe it's not. But because of this incubation period, this time between when someone is exposed and when they start developing symptoms, it can be as much as 16 days before someone starts to develop those symptoms. As a result of that, waiting until the main CDC or anybody else tells you that there is a case in your community is up to 16 days too late. So for that reason, we recommend that everybody behave or go about their lives as if COVID-19 is already in your county, in your city, in your town. Now, so that, that's, that's sort of how we think about this in epidemiological terms. If you wait until your county shows up on the board before you start practicing physical distancing, before you start really intensely washing your hands, I fear that you've waited too long. So that's why as an epidemiological matter, you know, that, that's why we're asking people to start taking action now. Uh, Going to go in the back and then over to Steve. So, yes, sir. discussion of a more regional type shutdown of an area. Is there anything, any planning ahead on that type of thing? So regional, you mean within the state? Right. Or so let's say Cumberland County gets more cases. Does that area get cordoned off? It's something that, that our team has been thinking a lot about. Um, even within Cumberland County, the population density there within Portland is on the order of about 3,000 people. Uh, still nothing close to Manhattan, which is on the order of 70,000 people per square mile. But you raise a very good point, and it's something that we have been thinking about. Maybe these stay-at-home procedures might only apply for more densely populated areas. I would still raise the same questions, however, about the extent to which they should be enacted any possible implications of those orders on, say, the blood supply, uh, as well as whether the actions that Governor Mills has already put into place, whether the marginal value of a stay-at-home order, what do we get for that? That's the question. That's the analysis that we have to undertake. Uh, I want to be careful about it. I want us to be thoughtful about it. I'm delighted to be, not delighted, but I'm, we are able to have this discussion uh, with everybody in Maine right now. And I, I want to be able to provide a glimpse into how we're approaching these analyses. So, uh, Steve, and then over here. Um, go ahead, Michael. I forgot my question. Okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering how you know what you've done already is working. I mean, what do you, do you think what the governor has done so far is working uh, as you uh, look at these more drastic steps that other states and cities are doing? Yep. It, Michael, right? Yeah. So, Michael's question. Sorry, got to have some Diet Coke. Uh, Michael's question is. How do we know? Do we know? When will we know whether the steps that have already been implemented are working? And it's a, it's a great question. We, we might, here's how we think about this. We, of course, on a daily basis are taking a look at the number of new cases. But again, because of this incubation period, this time between when somebody is exposed to when they start showing symptoms, that period can be as high as up to 16 days. 14 of 16 days, according to some new studies. So at a minimum, the first possible period at which we might really be able to have some good detectable data is, it, is several days after any of these measures are put into place. The second thing, though, is that these measures, these physical distancing measures, are tried and true in the public health world. Uh, they go back and, and, and there's good data to suggest the efficacy of these going all the way back to the 1918 pandemic. And there's great analyses that have been done about comparing cities that did impose or implement these restrictions versus those who didn't. Uh, we've talked about those and I'm, we're happy to put some of that analysis on the website. But because of the nature of infectious diseases and this time period, it's not as if in real time on an hour by hour basis, we have evidence. It takes a little bit of time for that evidence to be generated. That's the nature of science. But based on the historical experience going back over 100 years with imposing these physical distancing requirements, we have very strong basis on which to believe that this is supported by the best available public health. 
Steve. Came to me. Um, Great. Yeah. You mentioned and spoke at length about the testing backlog. Mm -hmm. Have you, are you able to quantify it? How many tests are waiting in queue here? Yep. Yeah. And I think you described before how they're prioritized. Mm -hmm. you could do that again. So Steve's question is, uh, how large is the backlog at present? We'll, we'll get you the exact number, Steve. The, the laboratory is tabulating exactly what it is. Um, but what I, what I want to say is that even though we recognize it exists and we recognize the frustration that it causes, this focus on high-risk groups is to really make sure that we can get folks data, answers to questions that would immediately change clinical management as well as answers to questions that could have wide-ranging public health implications. For example, if a physician or an EMS personnel were impacted. We'll get you the precise numbers, but we are also, again, looking for ways to increase our testing capacity and decrease our reliance on one of the chemicals that we know to have a, a major national shortage of right now. Several times. Yep, it's uh, so it's um, it's called the. Um, I'll, I'll get you the exact title. It's called Magna Pure. It's made by Roche. We'll get you the exact title of it. But it's a chemical that's used in what's called the extraction process. That's the process that takes a swab that might be taken from someone's nose and prepares that swab and extracts the um, the, the the sample in such a manner that it can be run on our DNA fingerprint machine. And there's a specific reagent or chemical uh, for which there is a national shortage right now. That's not in the kits that you received? No. The, so the, the, the kits really include the, the reference DNA fingerprint. Um, and, and those are the kits that we receive from the U.S. CDC. Uh, those are called probes and primers. And that's essentially the, the mugshot that we compare any sample against to see whether it is COVID-19 or something else. But in order to get us to that point, we have to be able to extract the, the, the potential virus from the swab that we receive. And right now, the chemical that is used in the machine that does that, uh, that's where the shortage is right now. We will get you more information, uh, as much as you wanna know uh, about the extraction process, we will be able to get for you, 100%. Yes? Do you think if the White House used this military authority that's been invoked Roche and other companies to produce more of that reagent more rapidly? Could that be done? I, I can't speculate about what the White House could do here. What I can say is that the faster that any of these companies, whether that's Roche or anyone else, the faster that they can increase the production of all of these reagents, the more quickly that testing will be able to be rolled out on a national basis, much more so than is do being done right now. Um, whoever can make that happen, I urge them to do so as quickly as possible. You don't have the purchasing power to make that happen. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, no state does. No state does. Uh, let's see, we're uh, over here. Yep. Well, a question about symptoms. Uh, the last day we've been hearing that there may be some other symptoms yeah. of COVID-19, digestive Good. problems. Uh, someone even suggested, I believe, loss of taste, things like that. Are those are those legit? Are those indicators, early indicators that somebody might have? Uh, so the question is, as we learn more about COVID-19, are we learning more about different symptoms that might be the initial ways in which people might have or be detected as having it. And you're right, there have been some interesting papers that have come out just in the past few days suggesting that for some segment of people with COVID-19, the very first symptoms that they might have are not respiratory, but rather gastrointestinal. This is nausea or vomiting, other such GI symptoms. So there's much more research that's being done. Um, now, what we don't quite know yet is for everybody who might have COVID-19, what percentage of them first have GI symptoms versus respiratory symptoms? So that's, that's research that's being done right now to try to help us get a better handle on what the initial symptoms really are. It's just, a, it's, it's further evidence of how quickly the research on COVID-19 is moving. It seems like every week we learn more and more. Now, your other question was about loss of, uh, loss of taste. I saw some of that research as well. Again, it's interesting, it's early, it's intriguing. Even if it bears out to be the case, what percentage of everybody out there with COVID-19 would be accounted for by individuals whose first symptom is loss of taste? We're not sure yet. So, yep, Michael. 
Uh, just follow up. Sure. I assume that you don't want everybody who has intestinal trouble to suddenly be afraid they've got COVID. So well, you're right. You, you know, so the question is, does everyone who has an upset stomach have COVID-19? The answer there is no. The, the thing that's out there that is still much more likely to cause upset stomach or GI symptoms is something like undercooked food or improperly handled food, not COVID-19. So again, we don't quite yet know, and, and we may not know as a scientific matter, of all the people with COVID-19, what percentage of them have respiratory symptoms versus something else. Based on the data that we have right now, however, the vast majority of folks still start their COVID-19 journey or their course with respiratory symptoms as opposed to anything else. Uh, Michael, I think you're next. Yeah, I just, I had a question. You, you, you outlined the counts of, you know, the count of, of PPE, and I wanted mm -hmm. to understand sort of how long, you know, I wanted to kind of get some context as to how long that will last. Have, yeah. you, have you noticed any price gouging when it comes to PPE? Uh, for example, I've seen a main firm that's selling masks for $8 a pop you know, mm -hmm. as a unit. Um, what are the prices that hospitals should be expecting to pay for this stuff on the market? And, and can you outline sort of the different ways you source this stuff? Great. So Michael's question is around the utilization rate of this protective equipment by hospitals and then questions around price gouging. Let me say one thing really very clearly at the top. The PPE that Maine CDC distributes, there is no charge associated with that. That is our obligation. It is what we do as a public health agency. So right at the top, I just want to be very clear. No one, no entity, whether they be a hospital, uh, a retirement community, a long-term care facility, no one is being charged. Uh, the, the rate of utilization of this protective equipment, it really does vary by the type of facility. Um, for example, with the community that we talked about last night, they wanted to have the PPE on hand in case a resident became acutely ill so that their own healthcare staff would be prepared. So their anticipated rate of utilization will be far lower than a major tertiary care center with a major large ICU operation. I think the point though, is that we, we remain in constant contact with each and every one of these facilities as their needs change, as their resource requests change, we work with them to fulfill as much of it as we can. Now, with respect to price gouging, I've been, I've made, been, been made aware of these reports anecdotally. Uh, again, we, the work that we're doing is, is, is gratis. It's, we're not talking about price and anything. So with respect to questions around price gouging, uh, the attorney general's office is really taking the lead there. Um, Kevin? Mm -hmm. ventilators. Great. Kevin's question is around ventilators. And what updates do we have? Um, as of this morning, there are 252 ventilators available across the state out of a total of approximately 301 ventilators. Uh, we are looking at acquiring additional ventilators through different channels. The first is an official request that we made to the U.S. government for 300 additional ventilators. Uh, that's not a purchase. That would be, again, a distribution from the strategic national stockpile that we've talked about. Uh, so not purchasing that. However, we are also simultaneously looking at other ways to increase our supply of ventilators if the federal government is not able to fulfill our complete request. So that may involve and include everything up to additional purchases. We're looking at that as well, working with different suppliers as well. But th th those are the latest numbers on what we've got. Um, I think I've got time for one last question. Uh, all right, last question. How are you doing and your staff? Well, um, the question is, is, is how's the team doing? It, first of all, I appreciate the concern. Um, it's not about me. Um, it's definitely not about me. If, if I am able to stand here every day and talk about what's going on and talk about my vision for it, it is because I have had the privilege and the luxury of, of standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, those are the people in this room, in this building, at our agency, across the administration. They are the team that are working on getting all of the projects that I talk about and getting them done and getting the numbers so that I can communicate with everybody. And for that, I, they are really, truly the unsung heroes. And so I thank them for that. Um, we're, we're, we're doing okay. 
You know, the, this, this is a challenging situation for all of us across the state. And as much as um, we have an obligation to the people of Maine, uh, this is a marathon. And so I have tried where possible to ask my team to, to go home, spend time with their family, spend time with their dogs. Uh, I'm trying to do the same as po where possible. Uh, my family made a West African soup last night and I made, wanted to make sure I was home for that. But um, this is a long-term activation. And so the message that I've tried to convey to my staff is not just one of gratitude, but also that they practice the same types of self-care uh, that I've talked to with everyone here about across the state. So with that, um, thank you all for being here. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a time of stress. It's a time of uncertainty. There are people there to help you. And even if they can't be there with you, they can be there for you. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll talk soon.